good shape. So. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, today we're going to interview John Lynch. John was a radio operator on a B-25 and a gunner. John, nice to have you here this morning. Nice to be here. Okay. <coughs> John, tell me when and where were you born? Born in Detroit, Michigan in um, 1927, April 23rd. And that was a big year, 1927, huh? Mm -hmm. Lindbergh. It was a month before Lindbergh through the Atlanta. Babe Ruth, yeah. Four Horsemen. That's right. That was a, that was a big year. Mm -hmm. um, I know that your dad was in World War One, mm -hmm. and a matter of fact, a book has been published, uh, and I've got it up there. I'm going to put a uh, zoom in on it a little bit so that people can. But can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, about your dad and how he got involved in World War I? Yes, World War I was on, and uh, the night that Dad graduated from University of Ohio, he got on the train and went up to Ottawa and enlisted in uh, Canada's crack infantry regiment, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. And that's the name of the book, Princess, that's, that's, it's what they call the Princess Pat. That's right. And there's a song, I think, uh, I know our kids sing it, something about the Princess Pat. Really? Uh-huh. What yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Uh, um, I should have them here so they can sing it first. <laughs> but obviously the name is Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, 1917 to 1919, and John William Lynch was your father. That's right. And it says M.M., what does that mean? It stands for Military Medal. Military, military Medal. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's the same as the Silver Star. Okay, so and it's the, ex oh, the exciting story of an American volunteer in the Canadian Army during World War One. I've read the book myself, and I really found it interesting. I think anyone would, would that uh, has any interest at all in World War One. Okay, I'm going to back up. We want you to continue on, John, with uh, how your dad got involved in that. Well, he, uh, he went to signal school. He uh, was assigned to the Princess Pats. Went overseas. He went out to France with them. Uh, they were and, and the reason that he didn't join the American Army because we weren't in the war that's at the right. time, is that correct? That's and right. Why was he so interested in getting well, into Well, he wanted to get into action before he was over with. <laughs> 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 and he did. Was he that type of a person? That, uh, yes, he was, pretty much so. Uh, he came back a much changed person as a result of the war. Um, he um, was just very much changed, very much subdued. Uh, light infantry is assault inf infantry, and uh, it wasn't uncommon for the Princess Pats to come out of a big battle with 80% casualties. Uh, Dad said, remembered after the Battle of Amiens that they'd call names from maybe 30, call 30 names before somebody would say here or he's dead or he's wounded or something like that. And uh, they kept having to rebuild the, the regiment time after time. After the World War I, it became Canada's standing army. Up until World War, II, up until the Korean War, actually, and the Princess Pats fought in World War II and the Korean War. So, when he first got over there, then where, where did he first? Uh... He went in the line uh, on the Western Front, um, had a fairly quiet sector, uh, which they do to new troops. And then his first major battle was uh, was uh, the Battle of Amiens. And uh, what they did, they always left two men out of every regiment as seed, you might say, for the, for the rebuilding of the regiment. And he was left out in that first battle. The second battle was the Battle of Arras, in uh, which he won the military medal in, a, in, in Jigsaw Wood. Um, then his third battle was the Battle of Cambrai, where uh, they suffered something like 87% casualties and uh, Dad was badly wounded um, in front of Cambrai, attacking Cambrai. Uh, okay, that medal is called a military medal, and what did you say, it's the same as our... Our Silver Star. Our, our Silver Star. Uh, do you know uh, the circumstances that he was awarded that? What, what? Yes, they had... They had um, they were signaling by lamp, and the river Scarp lay on their right, and uh, they, they were in plain view of the enemy because they were attacking up one side of the, so, uh, the river Scarp, but the Germans still held the other side. 
and uh, they decided to sight in their lamp and see if they could pick up headquarters, which was about two miles away, and lo and behold, they could. And so a captain came along and he said, can you signal the headquarters and tell them where we are because we expect a German counterattack and we don't want to be thrown out of here. And uh, so it took them about 45 minutes to get the message through. Uh, Dad uh, lay up and exposed in open ground aiming the, the lamp and a fellow named Roberts uh, was a signaler in the bottom of the shell hole. And um, several times the uh, headquarters company thought they'd been blown off, blown away because the shelling, the shelling was just terrific. The Germans knew what they were doing. They knew they were getting information back to headquarters. And they tried to stop it with overhead shrapnel bursts and regular high explosive shells. And after about 45 minutes it was subdued, but Dad was just on the verge of shell shock. White as a sheet and shaking like a leaf. And, and um, the captain asked for his name, rank, and serial number, put it in his book, and lo and behold, when they were back in Eris, um, after the battle, the, the company commander summoned him and cited him for uh, bravery, bravery on the field of battle. That's what the medal says. Um, and he, well, you say he was wounded at Cambrai? At Cambrai. And, and what, how did that, what were the circumstances? Well, happen? they were advancing toward Cambrai. Cambrai was about a mile and a half in front of them. Cambrai was an anchor post in the Hindenburg Line. And that day, uh, the Allies broke the Hindenburg Line and started the, the retreat that didn't stop until November 11th. It was the 28th of September, 1918. And uh, it was the second day of the battle. Uh, they were passing through the Royal Canadian Rifles that had been pretty well shot up. And um, they got, as I say, about a mile from uh, Cambrai, opposite the village of Monchi, on the left, and Burlone Wood on the right. There was a sunken road, and they all piled into the sunken road, and there was a captain there, and he blew his whistle and waved his arm, let's go, men. And there were men of all units milling around there, and they jumped up. And, so they got out of the open ground, all of a sudden uh, a shell landed right to his right side. And uh, he, um, it looked like he'd blown his, he'd blown his head off. And um, as the stretcher bearers worked over him, one of them said, this one's dead, and the other one said, this one is too. And uh, he said, no, I'm not. And the stretcher bearer knew who he was, he knew him. And uh, he realized that his head bowed and, uh, and the back of his head was all blown out. He uh, had a bad wound just below his, his left knee. When I was a little boy, you could almost stick your finger through it. And then um, as he lay there, he was wounded by shrapnel and machine gun fire in the left wrist again. And uh, he thought after about, he said, I don't think I'm going to survive the barrage. And then majestically, about two minutes later, the barrage let up. And um, he flagged down some German prisoners that were coming by, and Dad could speak German, and I uh, asked him to carry him to the rear, and uh, they carried him on past Inchi toward Eris, mile after mile after mile, because they couldn't understand English. He was slowly bleeding to death, and just fortunately, he passed uh, their own uh, mess lines. The cook, one of the cooks saw who he was, and uh, he had covered himself with a German overcoat, and they thought it was just another German. And uh, he said, gee whiz, he said, it's Lynch, that's John Lynch. He said, let's get him to the hospital. And they got him to a dressing station. And then he went back to England for recovery and finally was discharged, what they call struck off the strength uh, in um, 1919. And, uh, because his parents had moved to Fresno, California during in 1917, he asked to be discharged here on the West Coast. He was discharged in Vancouver and came down to Fresno in 1919. He didn't write that book. Uh, he, he wrote, I remember during the Depression, he would sit at the typewriter and peck away at it. He wrote it three or four times. He was a good yarn. And um, I know parts of it he wouldn't read. Mom would let we kids read it. Uh, particularly the parts about the hand-to-hand -hand combat and that type of thing. And. Um, he uh, pecked away at it and pecked away at it, and just before he died in 
five, uh, I believe it was my sister Patricia, who was named after the regiment, uh, I believe she sent it into a publisher because she's an author herself. She writes, has written a number of books, and they published it. And it's the only history of the Prince's Pats during those two years, 1917-1919. Curiously enough, Bob Patterson, who was a docent here, his father was in the same regiment and uh, was wounded at Passchendaele, which was one of the terrible battles of World War I. Uh, you say your mom wouldn't let you guys, when you were kids, read it, read parts of it? No, particularly the hand-to-hand -hand combat. Dad was very proud of his regiment. He started the Canadian Legion post in Fresno. Uh, but as is true of many veterans, there was really nobody that he could talk to that understood what he'd gone through. There were American veterans, but the American Army and the British Army were quite different. They fought in different sections of the Western Front, and uh, their tactics were somewhat different. So, was he uh, like a rifleman or...? or yes, he was a rifleman. He went in as a private and came out as a private. And do you recall, what, did they use Enfield's rifles or do you...? They used the, the Lee Enfield Mark III. That was a very heavy rifle. How would that differ from our uh, M1, for instance? Well, it, differ, it differs in, in length. It's a longer rifle. Uh, and it has a very, very long bayonet. I have the rifle and the bayonet at home. The bayonet is a full 20 inches long. And uh, uh, bayonet fighting was still very much in vogue in World War I. In World War II, they used the bayonet, but not near as much. And in the Korean War, they used it very little. And of course, in Vietnam, they used it very little. But in those days, bayonet fighting had a big, heavy rifle to block the other guy big bayonet to, to run him through. And run him. The, big, the bayonet was virtually a short sword, is what it was. In World War I, uh, at least at the beginning of it, uh, they were still uh, advancing uh, in mass on machine gun yes. nests and things like that, and, 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 and as well as the uh, artillery was so shells were so big, so much bigger than they had been. That, did he talk about that? Did he, was that part of the, the casual that they took? Is those type of outmoded tactics that they used, do you think? Uh, their tactics had improved by the last couple of years of the war. The first years of the war, 1914, 1915, 1916, those mass attacks were very much in vogue. As a matter of fact, the French infantry rebelled, mutiny against their officers. The French call that Elan, or Dash. And uh, they would just rush pell-mell into the German trenches and, and just get slaughtered. Uh, by 1917, 1918, they had learned to attack a, a machine gun nest by flanking it. The gunner couldn't turn his gun quick enough to cut him off. When they got in bombing range, they'd, they'd throw what they call a Mills bomb, which was like our hand grenade, only it was much bigger. It had a chemical fuse and sputtered and spat and what have you. Uh, but uh, it was a a little bit more sophisticated. They began to use flamethrowers too, which were more effective. And had they developed a tank to any uh, yes. extent then too? Yes, the tanks had, uh, the first battle of Cambrai in 1917, they used about, um, I think about 40 tanks. And they blew the Germans away. They made them get into them about five to seven miles, but they didn't expect that. And so they didn't Follow think up. about following up, and the guys had to abandon their tanks and, and, and run back. And a lot of them didn't, of course, didn't make it. The Germans got a good look at the tanks. The Germans had tanks too, awkward-looking thing, looked like a square box. But uh, the best tanks were the were the British tanks. The French had a tank they called a Whippet. It was a little two-man tank, it was a lot faster, a lot more mobile. But these big Mark III and Mark IV British tanks weighed several tons. They had uh, Hotchkiss quick-firing cannon in them, and they had machine guns. They were just huge brutes. 
aviation in World War One. Did he talk about that any? And, and, really? and how did uh, how did that fit into what he was doing and that sort of thing? Well, aviation uh, came of age in World War One. Um, Billy Mitchell, who commanded the American Air Force in the, the Battle of San Mahil, took 1,500 of our fighter planes and used that to suppress and interdict German reinforcements coming up from the rear. And he really showed the infantry officers what aviation support meant and what it could do. And from that time on, aviation changed. But Dad, uh, they used to bet on the dogfights. Uh, well, the, the trench warfare was kind of boring. Yeah. If you weren't for the for the uh, the fighting on a good, nice sunny day, well, they could sit there in the bottom of the trench and watch the butterflies over their heads and watch the air battles, and they would uh, bet on them, and they got bombed quite a bit. Um, the night before he uh, was wounded, uh, I believe it was, uh, they were bombed quite heavily by German aircraft. The Germans had a bomb with a big broomstick device on the nose of it so that when it hit the ground, it went off and spread shrapnel all over. It killed cows and horses two or three hundred yards away. And it was a very effective anti-personnel bomb. And um, I remember one story he told, uh, I don't think it's in his book, but he said uh, a German plane was bombing the highway. Most French highways were fairly straight. They were laid out by the Romans. And he hear the bombs crump, crump, crump. And he said, he looked out there, and here was a British dispatch rider on a motorcycle going flat out, just staying ahead of the bombs. And he said, up about a mile, they know the road, the road made a 45 or a 90 degree turn. And they never knew whether the motorcycle rider <laughs> made it or not, or whether the German ran out of bombs by the okay. time they got there. But one night, uh, they, were, they had, uh, had been bombed by uh, the big Gotha bombers, and they were after their artillery horses in what they called an artillery park. They would put them in a woods. And um, the first night uh, uh, the guy came over, the uh, commanding officer said, well, he won't do that again. He assembled all the machine guns in the area. And sure enough, in the evening they came over again. And when, he did, when they did, they all fired in the air at the exhaust of the German bombers and didn't touch them. The Germans simply went away and came back at a higher altitude. But uh, they had a, a fighter plane, it was probably a Sopwith Camel, or maybe a Sopwith one and a half Strutter. And he said they heard the engine cough and, and uh, saw the exhaust, it ran out across the, the, the field and uh, took to the air. And he said pretty soon they saw the two streams of tracers and then they saw the fire coming from the big bomber and it went down. And the next morning they went over there and they said that the nose gunner's boots were just sticking out of the ground. That was all that was left to him. Yes, they used airplanes quite quite a bit. Yeah. So when your dad came back, you say he was kind of a changed person. Very much so, yeah. Understandable for what he'd been through, I'm sure. Yeah. Was he bitter about it? or? Uh... No. Uh, dad was a small man. He was about 5'8", and um, had a tendency to be a little bit feisty played football in high school and in college and boxed a little bit. As a matter of fact, my uncle was a, um, was a uh, championship light heavyweight boxer and Dad was his handler. Um, after the war, Dad, Dad didn't want any more of that. Um, he, he changed his religion. Um, he was Catholic, Irish Catholic. He never again went to Catholic Church. Just, just changing quite a bit. So did, uh, what kind of work did he do then Matt, when he came back? When he came back, he went to work for Standard Oil as an accountant in, in uh, Detroit. And uh, then he got transferred out. So to, when he came back home, did you say he was at, they were in Fresno? Or? It, no, he was at, uh, uh, he was in Fresno. And then he went back to Ohio to marry my mother and uh, got a job with Standard Oil in, in uh, Detroit. And um, then he got transferred out here to California, and, and I was about two or three months old when we got loaded in the back seat of a 1924 Model T Ford and uh, came to California. We had 43 black flat, flat tires on the trip. Uh, 19, what did you say, 1924? 1924. Model T. Yeah, and um, 
it was in the days before the Federal Highway Program was completed, and a lot of the roads we came on were, were old wagon roads, were dirt roads. We came into California over the old Tioga Pass Road out of Mono Lake, if anybody can imagine that, down into Yosemite. So you came over which road? The Tioga Pass Road. It was a control road in those days, just a logging road. And why Dad chose to come over to <laughs> Sonoma, over the Tioga Pass, I'll never know. A beautiful country, but very difficult. And what area is that in? Where is the Tioga it's Pass? It's just north of, of Yosemite Valley. Where? Well, we stopped in Fresno, and then uh, Dad had been transferred to the Standard Oil Plant in Bakersfield. Oh. And uh, we lived in Bakersfield until about 1931, and they closed that plant, and the Depression was on. And Dad got a job at night on a Shell service station because he was a college graduate. That's how tough oh. times were in those days. In 1931, he took a job as manager of the Gilmore Oil Company in Tulare, which is about 60 miles up Highway 99 north of, of Bakersfield, and we moved up there. Uh, it might be interesting, Gilmore Oil had a gasoline they were promoting called Blue Green, and um, the guy that was pitching it was none other than the famous aviator Roscoe Turner. And he came to visit the, the, the plant one day, and he had a little lion cub in the back of a trailer he called Gilmore. And uh, he had his powder blue uniform on, and, and uh, he'd been in World War I, I think just toward the end of it, and Dad invited him out to the house for a chicken dinner that night. I don't think I ate a bite as I sat at the table and listened, <laughs> listened to the two of them talk about World War I. G-I-L-M-O-R-E. And so that was, what year was that? That must have been 31 through about 37 or 8. And, and what, 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 in what capacity? He was a manager. So, let's see, you would have been about was like six to ten years old, so well, like nine or ten. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, and that was uh, that was in Gilmore, the or no Tulare. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, what was it like for you in those early years growing up? Well, it was tough. We lived on a ranch. Dad worked in town at the at the plant, and we had a ranch. We had various hired men who came and went, but. Uh, the Depression was very heavy on the land. Uh, as a matter of fact, John Steinbeck that wrote Grapes of Wrath, that's where, that's what it was about. That's where it was. Uh, he worked as a peach picker at Tagus Ranch, which at that time was the biggest peach ranch in the world outside of Tulare. And um, Dad knew him, had met him, and that's where he got his background for the Grapes of Wrath. And I lived through the Grapes of Wrath. Very, very emotional times. The people would come to California. What happened? Take us. I advertised for 600 peach pickers, and somebody distributed those handbills in Oklahoma, for the, the Kansas and Oklahoma uh, parts of Texas were just being blown away in the dust bowl. And uh, about 60,000 of those people threw a mattress on top of their car, and away they came to California. Well, that was a way too many people. There wasn't enough to eat. Their babies would die. They, they would bury them out in the orchard because they couldn't afford a funeral for them. Same thing with their, with, but just everybody was buried just there. Right. And uh, it was terrible times. Uh, but for your family, it wasn't as bad as that, no. obviously. We were but considered old California because we were there in the 20s. Oh, okay. That's right. Your grandfather had, had moved out there. In the yeah. 20s. Yeah, the, actually, yeah, I, yeah, grandfather and grandma and grand, grandpa moved in 1917 and built a house in downtown Fresno. What, what, uh, what did your grandfather do? Or he was a railroad man. Uh, Santa Fe? Or? Uh, 
Yes, it was Santa Fe. That's right. So, what kind of uh, what did you do for uh, as a kid? Did you have any brother? You had one sister. Did you have any? Uh, I had three sisters. I had an older sister, and then I was number two. Number three was brother Ed. Number four was sister Joanne, and number five was sister Rosemary. Three girls and two boys. And what did you guys do for entertainment uh, when you were a kid? Not much. Um, tell, me, tell me about your ranch. What did, what did, did you just grow things? Did you have animals? To well, we, we had uh, we had a, uh, we had we raised, raised horses. We raised cattle. Uh, we also had row crops. We had cotton later on. We raised wheat, barley, alfalfa, um, jip corn, um, which is Milo maize, short corn. Uh, had a big chicken ranch and eventually had a fairly good sized Jersey dairy. And when you live on a ranch, uh, work is never done. Yeah. The only vacation we ever had was to take a week off and drive up to the, to the San Francisco World's Fair in 1939. That's when Treasure Island was built. Treasure Island, uh, that was where the fair was? So that's, why yeah, that's why they built Treasure Island. Oh, I didn't know that. That's where it got its name, Treasure Island. Uh -huh. The big feature of the fair was the Cavalcade of the West. And it was a stage about, oh God, as long as a football field. And the old West was just dying, had just, was just dying away, and the new West was coming in. And it was kind of a salute to the passage of the old West. And uh, they rode horses across the stage and stagecoaches and things like that. Did you like to ride horses when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, I rode them. Uh, I rode them when I was so small that to get on them, I had to climb up in this big walnut tree and drop down on their back. <laughs> And my little legs stuck almost straight out, and um, we uh, herded cattle with them. And um, I got to be a fairly decent rider, although I was never a very, never a very, I wasn't a natural rider. So, um after Tulare, did you move somewhere else then? Well, I graduated from high school. Oh, you went to high school in Tulare. Okay. Tulare. Did you play sports? And yes, play? I did. Uh, what, what did you play? Uh, I played the basketball, and I ran the mile, and I played football. You were pretty tall for that in, in I was time, a, were you? I was a big guy in those days. Now, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six is, is kind of average. How tall are you then? I, see, I was 6'2", I'm about 6'1 and a half. So did you play like center on the basketball team? Yeah, I did. I played. Oh, in basketball, I played um, um, guard, and um, in football, I played um, a center. I played right tackle, right guard, linebacker. We used the old um, single wing to the right, the old balance line to the right, and then we went into the T formation when I was a senior. I had a hunting accident when I was a junior, so I couldn't. I couldn't play because I'd been shot in the foot. Uh -huh. But uh, how did that happen? Oh, we'd been hunting rabbits, and um, I knelt down to get a drink of water out of a pump. I handed my rifle to this other guy, and he put his finger through the trigger guard, and somehow the rifle was off safety. And I swear, I, I was always dead, always hammering it into me. Did you handle a rifle? And I got my first rifle when I was seven years old. When you handle a rifle, you handle it safely. And I think that he did that. I think he picked it off. And as his arm went down like that, it just squeezed the round off and went right through the, the side of my left foot. And uh, about the other side. Yeah, uh what did it feel? I mean, did you, did it hurt right away or did it just... Well, it just felt like somebody took a hammer and banged and hit you on the side of the foot. And, uh, 
I hobbled out of the house. Bob took me into Dr. Matthias. Dr. Matthias was, um, Bob Matthias was Olympic Delamp, yeah, Olympic right. Catholic chap. And that was his father. He was uh, our, our family doctor, huh. Dr. Charlie Matthias. And he ran a swab through there, and I made the mistake of watching it. And that's the first time in my life I ever got sick of my stomach. <laughs> But a 22 bullet is soft, and it just leaves all kinds of dent in you. And uh, years later, that lead would work out, and I'd be shaving and snag my razor on it. Remember that face in places like that? Huh. Okay. Um, did you uh, did you like to read and things like that when you were in school, or I mean, did, did would you consider yourself a good student? Did you like school? Well, yes, I liked history, and uh, my fourth grade teacher was a teacher named Miss Stapp. S-T-A-P-P, -P. and she would go to the county library and bring me history books. Uh, I became an absolute authority on the American Civil War. I was just, I was just fascinated with it, and that's still pretty much my strongest suit as a historian. Um, one of our Patty Stump, you know Patty. Mm -hmm. The other day, she said she was reading something and um, realized that not all the Northerners were that interested in freeing the slaves, oh, yes. and that they treated them just almost as badly as, as the Southern people did afterwards. And she said that it just she always thought that the Civil War was all about freeing the slaves, and and now she doesn't feel so good about it. You know, like, a lot of factors involved. Yeah, it What's wasn't, your view on that? It wasn't until the Battle of Antietam, after which uh, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, that it became a slave issue, really. It was more of a keeping the Union together. Well, they were admitting states, and they were admitting them on a free state and a slave state issue, and, and it was about which states were going to be more prosperous. The big fight over California, for example when it was admitted in 1850, and big fight over Kansas. And uh, it was more a geopolitical squabble than anything else. So uh, what year did you graduate from high school then? 1944. Okay, so then do you remember what you were doing on December 7th, 1941? Yes, I do. Uh, my brother Ed and I were playing football. We were throwing the football out in the yard. And um, about 11 o'clock, Dad came to the side of the house, the door, and he said, Boys, come in and listen to this. He said, Evidently, the Japanese are attacking someplace called Pearl Harbor. And I don't know really where it is, but he said, Come and listen to this. And you could hear the airplanes on the radio. And uh, the rest of the day, we sat glued to the radio. And, Phones rang and wild rumors were going back and forth. And the big rumor was the Japanese were going to take Hawaii and then move on in and land along the Pacific coast in the San Luis Obispo uh, Central Coast area. And uh, uh, rumors just just ran wild. The next morning was a Monday morning. We had a neighbor girl. Her name was Lois Nagata. Well, nobody knew the Nagata families. And that was really a problem with the Japanese. You really didn't know anything about them. They kind of kept to themselves. And um, Lois got on the bus and nobody would sit with her. And finally my sister Patricia went over and sat with her. And we got to high school and they called the General Assembly and we went into the auditorium and listened to President Roosevelt declare war and issue his Day of Infamy speech. But uh, we were very concerned. I knew something had happened, and I knew it was going to affect me. That's for sure. <laughs> I was a sophomore. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, did like her family? Did they send them away? Your neck, then, yes. By days? April, they were gone. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't realize, but we did the same thing to the Italians and the Germans. We picked up about 1,500 Germans as the, the day after Pearl Harbor and about a, an equal amount of, of Italians. The Italians we tended to let go earlier, but some of the Germans we kept incarcerated until 1948, whereas we let the Japanese come on. 
I hadn't heard that before. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody, you know, they talk about, I think in, maybe in World War One, they did some of that. I didn't realize it. Because everybody says, well, you know, why did they do the Japanese and not the Germans, uh, the Italians? They did. But they actually did? They did, yes. Uh, FBI did. Well, they had them pegged. Leaders of the German American Bund and yeah, Nazi well, I mean, well, they were. I mean, what they were kind of the, the radical ones. I mean, the the pro-German. Well, you know, this country is is heavily populated by Germans. Oh, As a yeah. matter of fact, except for one vote, German would have been our national language. Uh, every once in a while, this comes an election around here, they recite that for you. Oh yeah. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of Germans. Yeah. There are a lot of Germans. My right. area, where well, I'm from, the German township. Okay, so, I'm talking to Noah about the flood. You mean? <laughs> well, well, it's funny. My grandfather, he'd say, uh, he'd say, oh, because we lived out in the country, and he, and he did too. Uh, uh, and he said, uh, when he was younger, and he said, oh, old, old man so and so, that old Dutchman lived over here, that old Dutchman lived there. And for a long time, I couldn't understand. I said, I don't know any Dutch people around here. Then I realized later on he was talking about Deutsch, the old Deutschman, uh, yeah. <laughs> the German, the Do Deutschland, the Deutschman. <laughs> so yeah, no, but, but I mean, it sounded like I don't know, maybe pre pretty much all the Japanese people they did, no matter oh yeah wh whether who they you know whether they uh, were involved in societies or anything like that, That's whether right. they were pro or, or yeah. anti. Yeah. yeah. Up in the Delta, Sacramento, Sacramento and San Joaquin Delta, there were a bunch of Filipino asparagus workers, and their foreman was Japanese. And they decapitated him and stuck his head on a smokestack, a, a exhaust stack of a John Deere tractor, and set it off across the, the island. Uh, things like that were happening to the Japanese again because nobody really knew who they were. They hadn't really integrated into oh, our right. society that's so much, right, yeah. and so yeah. yeah we uh, we played Delano in football. Delano was a heavily Japanese community, and those uh, teenage Japanese boys—they were mature as a 21, 22-year-old man. And they always just used, used to really mop us up. <laughs> okay. Um, now, when did you get interested in aviation? Oh golly. Uh, I guess I could say I really got interested in it when I was about eight or ten years old. And we went down to the dairy to the Dairyman's Cooperative Creamery to get some butter, and I saw a boy flying a model airplane, and that completely captivated me. And I started building model airplanes, and uh, I saved up my money. And when I was um, about eleven years old, I got my first ride in an airplane at Vice City Airport. Cost me three dollars for fifteen minutes. You were eleven years old. Yeah, and uh, I was just just enchanted with it. And I said, I, I knew at that time that I wanted to fly. Uh, you know what kind of plane it was? Uh, I think it was a uh, model of a J3 Piper Cub. So did you uh, did you read a lot of uh, did you read a lot about aviation then? After oh, that? So, uh, sure. Tailspin Tommy, that was one of the favorite uh, comic strips, and uh, Captain Midnight, and Smiling Jack, and, and uh, uh, you betcha. Did you um, get to go up in a plane anymore? Say between then and when you graduated from high school. After that first not, time. not that I can remember. Uh -huh. Not that I can remember. So, during um, while you were in the last couple of years in high school, did you follow the war oh, pretty closely? Yes. Uh, California kids had a tendency to go into the Navy because there was a big presence, a big naval presence here on the coast. And uh, Life magazine did an excellent job uh, covering the the big naval battles like Midway and Coral Sea and, and what have you, and um, so I followed the I followed the sea battles quite a bit, but not the air battles nearly, 
nearly as much. I had friends that uh, I lost a, a very good classmate, he was a tail gunner on B-17, Johnny Cedarman was his name. And the very first mission, they were shot down and crash landed outside of, of Hamburg, I believe it was. And uh, there were some German farmers there working some grain and they lined him up and stabbed him all to death with their pitchforks. And uh, began to, about every six weeks or so, they'd assemble the, the high school and you'd go out to the quad and put another plaque there. Some other, somebody else didn't come back. And Bob Phillips is another friend of mine on his third day up in the line in the, on the uh, Italian front, the Rapido River. He looked over his fox tail, uh, foxhole, and the German got him right between the eyes. So, you know, guys began to drop off like that that you knew, and he began to feel a little bit. And as he got closer and closer, uh, I deliberately didn't date much in my last year. Uh, I didn't want to get into a relationship with a girl. Uh, I knew where I was going, I knew what I had to do, I wanted to get it, get it done and get it over with, and, and what have you. And I was kind of eager to, to get in the fight. <coughs> that high school was all that boring, but uh, uh, I was just, I just wanted to get some excitement and, and see what was happening, and what was happening to other guys. They'd come back to school in their uniforms and, and uh, talk to us up on the on the stage, you know, and what have you, pretty sharp. And everybody was pretty much behind the war effort. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we had scrap metal drives and uh, victory gardens and uh, there was no there was no uh, male labor they, they were all gone uh, our own ha hired man Clarence went into the 15th Air Force he became a, a gunner and before he went overseas and was killed he came and visited us and I remember he had his front he's so proud he had all four of his front teeth were gold at last he had his own front teeth, <laughs> and, uh, and my parents was, was killed in action in, in the Mediterranean, I believe it was, uh, flying in the 15th Air Force. Um, but the weight of, the, of that work fell on we older boys. We went to school uh, half a day a day, and then we got on a school bus, and they would take us out to a ranch where they were harvesting certain crops. If you didn't have the crops at home you had to work on, then they'd take you to another farm someplace like that. We'd pick cotton or whatever it was that had to be done. And um, in the fall, mainly you picked cotton. And that was a terrible job, cotton picking. <laughs> um, we used German prisoners a lot to pick cotton with. And they were African Corps veterans. And uh, they were so sure that Germany was going to win the war and it was just a waste of time. Um, funny thing happened on this fellow. The colonel, dad took me to, dad belonged to the Lions Club, he took me to hear a colonel address the Lions Club on these prisoners. And he said when they came into New York, they came into um, into Camp Kilmer, and uh, they indoctrinated them for about six weeks in life in America, what the country's all about. And they put them on, on these prisoner ships, and they routed them deliberately through every one of our big manufacturing centers like Detroit and Pittsburgh. And, I remember going through Pittsburgh one night on a train during the war. It was like going into the jaws of hell. The, the, the skies were all lighted up with the glow of the Bessemers and the open hearts and the, and, uh, the big furnaces. And uh, uh, these guys first thought that, uh, that we were running the cars by them in the daytime, the same cars. Then they began to realize, no, those weren't the same cars. And they realized that we were, they were steadily moving west. And then by the time they crossed the Mississippi, they began to think this is a pretty good sized country. And by the time they got to California, they thought, how in the world did we have the nerve to take on a country like this? And they would try to escape, and they would escape, and they would, we had a billet at the Tulare County Fairgrounds. They would get out into, into Tulare Lake, at that time it existed, it was about 25 or 30 miles long and about 10 or 15 miles wide. And uh, the mosquitoes were as big as birds. And they would get out there and they'd stand that about three days and then they would surrender just all bitten to pieces. 
but uh, I had a lot of responsibility placed on me as a young man, frankly, uh, way too young, uh, because there was nobody else to do it. If the tractor needed repairing, I had to do it. And if I didn't know how to do it, I'd better find out how to do it. And um, if horses needed shoeing, I had to do it. And if I didn't uh, like that job, well, too bad. There's nobody else around to do it. And uh, things of that nature. The neighbors used to buy for me. Uh, they they wanted to hire me. I worked in the hay. And any time I wasn't doing anything, uh, I automatically had a job. It was tough. It was tough work. Uh, your brother was, was he older than you? Or, or no, Ed was three years younger than me. Yeah. Okay, uh, so as you're getting close to graduating, are you, you're thinking then about uh, enlisting, or, or, or were you, did you think you'd be drafted? Well, I, was, or I, knew, I, was, I was 17 when I got out, when I graduated, and I sure wasn't going to stay around that farm. Now you had to be 18. You had to be a volunteer to volunteer to the Air Corps, just like the Marines. But then that was your first choice. You wanted it for yeah, sure wanted to go to the Air Corps. Air Corps. And um, so I did a little artwork on my birth certificate. They didn't look at it too hard. I was a big kid. And I uh, went down to Mitter Field, which was um, on Highway 99, about 12 miles north of Bakersfield. It's uh, called Kern County Airport now, or Shafter Airport. And I enlisted there. And, um, where, where, where's Mitchellfield? It's where about it? 12 miles north of Bakersfield on Highway 99. <clears throat> and uh, they sent me to Camp Beale, which is now Beale Air Force Base. I stayed up there about four days and got That's my. B E A L E. B E A L B E A L E, yeah. Named after General Beale, the Civil War. Anyhow, then they sent me to uh, Keeslerville, Mississippi. K-E-E-S-L-E-R. Keeslerville, Mississippi. And I took uh, eight weeks of, of uh, what in those days was kind of combined infantry, basic. And then they, I had uh, some familiarity with radio, so they, and they needed radio operators badly. So they shipped me to Scottfield, Illinois, to radio school. How did you know about radios? Uh, my cousin Bob Rainey, uh, that was his avid hobby. And uh, Dad, being a signal man, when he had me working a, a uh, Morse key, and I knew Morse code by the like the back of my hand. And uh, he taught our scout troop to use the Morse key and to send messages. And, on and um, in those days, the radios were what they called super heterodyne radios, super hits. And, um, very easy to put together, and I had built my own crystal sets, a number of them. And um, so I went to Scott Field, and they needed badly radio operators for B-29s. So I stayed there, I think it was eight weeks, if I recall, maybe nine weeks. And then they shipped me to Kingman, Arizona, and um, to gunnery school. And then from gunnery school, and again, that was kind of a short deal. Uh, I was always an excellent shot. Um, I, um, I'd been told uh, that I could hit anything that flies, and I, I believe it. In those days, I'd take ten shells out and I'd bring back ten doves. Shooting? Doves, pheasants. With shotguns? Shotgun, yeah. But at any rate, um, I didn't last all that long uh, in gunnery school. Then they shipped me to uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I thought, sure, I was going to go to Roswell, New Mexico, or another B-29 base, but they shipped me to um, Columbia, South Carolina in B-25s. And then um, they needed B-25 guys real quick. Uh, the 340th Bomb Group, which is one of the oldest bomb groups in the country. Before we get any further, I want you, I'm going to put a picture up, and I want you to tell, uh, tell me a little bit about a B-25. Okay. If you wouldn't mind. <coughs> and you can use this as a pointer here, John. And let me let me get a little close up on here too. That top plane there, uh, obviously it's a B-25. It's a North American. Uh, and 
I don't see two L. Is there a top oh, turret? Just, just one, one second. Is there a top turret here? This one it looks like a D. It's probably a D. I don't see a top turret on that one. Let's see. The bottom looks like a bottom turret there, and the top turret is up here. On yeah, is it? Let, me, let, me see, let me see if I can get another. Another. I have a photograph, I think, of another B-25. Let me check that. Actually, I don't have one that's real handy with me, but we'll just you can show this me where the will, top turret is. This will do. Okay. okay. This appears to be a, a, a C or D model. Okay. That's because it looks like that may be where the bottom turret was. Uh -huh. But that was a bugger. <laughs> you uh, you fired using your knee, uh, on your knees, you had a knee pad there, and you fired uh, that gun using mirrors. And it was, I think, totally ineffective. Uh, this little thing here is a bumper that keeps a rubber bumper that keeps the pilot from dragging the rudders on the ground or on the runway when he's taking off. This is a tail gunner position. This is, uh, yeah, this has a uh, red star in it, a uh, red circle in the star. This is uh, a round escape hatch, oh. and uh, you knock that out and, uh, to get out of the, of the waist. This is a waist gunner position. There's a 50 caliber machine gun sticking out at the bottom there. Was it also the same way on the other side? Also the same way on the other side. And um, there's your an antenna. We had a series of had several different antennas going from the various uh, various parts of the plane. Um, these engines were right cyclone, R2600s. Very good engines. But flying in the waste, this was where my office was. This was where the radio operator gunner's office was. And you're behind that noise. And I'm fortunate to have as good at hearing as I do. I know a lot of guys that just don't have any more hearing left that uh, that uh, flew in, waste in the B-29. Uh, B-25. B-25. The, the bomb bay was covered over, and the whole airplane was enclosed, and it had heaters in it, so you didn't need this heat that the big guys did. You didn't have to wear all that electrical clothing or anything like that. But the bad part about this was, it was you and the tail gunner were the only two guys back here. And if one of you needed first aid, uh, you had to, the other one had to crawl to his to his assistance. Uh, to get forward, you had to take your all wore a chest packs. You had to take your chest pack and push in front of you and crawl across there, and then you drop down into the navigator's department here behind the pilot and the co-pilot. And that was a straight fall down about five feet. Nothing to hang on to. It was kind of difficult. Needless to say, we always stayed in the back. I didn't go up there much. This uh, red stripe here is a uh, warning stripe that, even with the propeller, tells you that don't go past or you're hit by the propeller. Uh -huh. There's a co-pilot, the pilot, and this is a classic bombardier nose in the B-25. It had um, a um, from four, one to four fixed forward firing machine guns, and then this gun was a flexible machine gun. Um, all the guns were, were uh, hydraulically charged except the two waste guns and this single gun here. And then they, they were uh, mechanically charged. Um, by, by, tell, tell me what's the different. I mean, well, what does that mean when it's hydraulically charged? Uh, yeah. Well, it charged itself. They had a cylinder there that, that, that jacked the shell into the chamber. Oh. And if you had a jam, you just press this little button and it automatically ejected the jam and jacked it into the charging. Otherwise, you had to reach up and take his handle and do it yourself. I see. <coughs> Uh, this uh, we had a range of about 1,700 miles. Uh, for long trips, we could take the bomb bay out, the bomb racks out, and put a middle tank in there that uh, would extend our range to about 3,100 miles. And when we went uh, overseas in that airplane, we used that tank. Uh, you could drop that tank out of the bomb bay uh, if you uh, wanted to save weight or, or you were through with it or something like that. Um, Otherwise, that's about it. Okay, where, where, where would the uh, uh, the top turret be? 
Top turret right. on this was right in here. It was over the navigator's department. So how many crewmen did what you But you had a tail gunner, radio operator gunner, a bombardier navigator, the pilot, the co-pilot, and a top turret gunner. Well, there was a top turret gunner, so yeah. you'd have probably six then. Yeah, so if you'll right. notice on the on the A, the B, C, and D models, it was the B model that Jimmy Doolittle uh, used in his uh, oh. Tokyo raid. The top turret is back here. But the, but the, the range of fire was so limited right. because of the rudders that uh, it was more effective if you put it up here. And uh, okay, you train. What did you train on when you first went there? On what model? This one for you? I, cha I, changed, uh, I trained for a little while on D's, and then I trained on J's. I didn't have much training before they they hauled us off to go overseas. These uh, black things here are uh, are de-icing boots, and. Um, Kept the ice off the wing, supposedly. And uh, what was the range? About 1,700 miles. Uh -huh. And uh, the bomb bomb load. The bomb load was about 3,000 pounds. Uh -huh. and, uh, and what was the flying speed? About 200. Uh, maximum level flying speed was about 280, 285. We never flew that fast. How did it compare to B-17? What was there? Well. B-17 could fly a little, not couldn't fly that fast, but B-17s when they were flying in combat flew at about 185 miles an hour. Uh, and we flew, when we flew in formation, we flew a lot slow. We didn't fly that slow. We flew around 190. Yeah. And um, when you, did you fly with, uh, uh, did you have fighter cover most of the time? That you, that Bill you Moyer know? flew fighter cover for us. Yeah. 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 He's a B-38 pilot here yeah. flying out of England. Okay. But, well, <coughs> okay, let's let's back up. That's, that's good with that. Well, I've talked to, uh, you're the first B-25 uh, crewman that I interviewed, and I've had several of the B-17 guys. Uh, when they flew, it was real important for them to keep the integrity of the box, mm -hmm. as they said. Was that... Did you guys do the same type Very of thing, so. formation yeah. flying? Until, until we released the bombs, and then we would go into what we called a 12-plane stagger. And we would drop down, uh, oftentimes, to pretty much ground level and strafe. We'd strafe barge traffic and, and uh, communications and, and uh, transportation, um, shoot up anything that the Germans were, uh, could use to move uh, stuff, with, including uh, Animals. And I didn't. I didn't like that because we raised horses when I was a kid, and I didn't like to kill horses. But, but that's what the Germans were using toward the end of the war. They didn't have gasoline. <coughs> okay. Um, so we're in Columbia. Okay, we're in Columbia, South Carolina now. And how long were you there? Not very long, as I recall. As I recall, I got there after Thanksgiving, and. Uh, that would be 1944. 1944, and uh, I was there. I was two and a half to three weeks, I think it was. We flew every day, um, but it was a surprise that I was going to be 25s. And, and uh, but I thought, of what happened to our bomb group? Well, in the, in November of 1944, our bomb group was stationed outside of Naples, and uh, the 340th was one of the oldest bomb groups in the Mediterranean, and Mount Vesuvius erupted. Uh, okay, yeah, you were, let's see, you were assigned to the 340th. Yeah. And this was when you were in Columbia? Uh, no, it's when I got over there. When you got, okay, yeah. well, okay, let's, let's back up a little bit. Okay. How, how did you get over there? We flew over. Okay. And we, you were uh, assigned a plane at Columbia? At Columbia, yes. Well, we were bringing replacement aircraft over because when that volcano erupted, it, it destroyed all the planes in our bomb group. And uh, we were bringing replacement aircraft okay. over three at a time. Okay, okay, so Vesuvius went off before you went over there? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. So We were bringing replacement yeah, okay. aircraft. Well, tell me a little bit about that, I mean, with Vesuvius, well, it, and where, where that station was. It was it was outside of Naples, um, and uh, the, the volcanic ash just covered all their airplanes and destroyed the instrumentation and everything like that. And, and uh, so they moved the personnel in the group to... Um, to uh, Bestia uh, on the island of Corsica. And uh, then we began to take replacement aircraft up 
three at a time. We left one night in a hurry, went to Eglinfield, Florida, down to Brazil, Ascension Island, Dakar, Cairo, Palermo, Sicily, and finally to the base outside of Bestia. Okay. Okay. After Brazil, it was... Uh, uh, Ascension Island. Ascension. Mm -hmm. Where's where Ascension Island? Oh, about Paramount. in the middle, middle of the, of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. It's off of the Guapa, Galapagos. Galapagos. Okay, from Ascension Island then to? To Dakar. And that is in? Africa. North Africa. In Cairo. In Palermo, Sicily. Bastia, -E That's on Corsica. Yeah. I was uh, was in Corsica uh, last year. We went on a little cruise hmm. along the Italian coast, and it was a small ship, so we could go into those things. And we went into Corsica, where uh, they kept uh, Napoleon. Well, we were, his, yeah, we were right across from there. We were 24 you? miles from Elba. Yeah, right across oh. the. Tyrrhenian Sea. Oh, that's right. Elba. Elba's where I went. Not You're right. You're right. Uh -huh. We could see uh -huh. Elba. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. So, um, how big was the the field, the air base there? It was uh, just a, not a large field, it was a small field. It wasn't a fighter field, I don't think. Uh, we didn't get on and off. It had no, we flew off mats there. <coughs> I guess since we're talking about the B-25, uh, let's go back to where probably the most famous, when people think of the B-25, they think of Doolittle's raid. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, about the problems they encountered and had, how they had to train for that? Yeah, the problems they encountered weren't as severe as the actual mission itself. Um, they, uh, I think it was Eglin field in Florida where they laid I out the, was, the, right. de the deck of the carrier and you had to take that airplane off and get it off that deck standing still. Well, when we do, when, when Doolittle launched his planes against Tokyo, they had a, a, a heavy wind blowing. They were heading into the wind. They had about 64 knots across uh, across the, the, the flight deck. And, and if you look, you'll see some of those planes were above the carrier island. They'd taken off by midship, it, they were well into the air, and uh, so uh, uh, the training uh, was was good. But they really did need one plane. Got a little excited, and he forgot to to, uh, to lower his flaps 20 degrees, and he kind of dropped down. But he he pulled off. I've seen. I've, yeah, that made that's it. one you always see, in, in the, and I assume that all of them were like that. And no. that's the one that they show in the newsreels and things like that. One that goes down and then comes up again. Yeah. And I thought that was all of them did that. Yeah. No, you, the, the technique was to, uh, I believe, was to stand on your brakes, right. and then when the landing ship officer, the LSO, dropped his flag, then you were at full power, you released your brakes, and you went forward, and you, you went forward in, the, in almost a stall configuration with your elevators up, and uh, you just kind of staggered off. As I say, the wind, in the actual takeoff, the wind was so strong going across the deck, it did uh, Their biggest problem was the had to launch sooner than they had planned on. That's right. They ran out of gas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you ever talk to any anybody that was uh, involved in, in, in that? Uh, did Great. You, uh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, the Doolittle chapter of the Air Force Association is the Los Angeles Basin chapter. And about every five years they have a reunion. And I uh, met a lot of those fellows. And then here, uh, the last time we did that program here, I did it. And I think uh, two of Ted Lawson's uh, daughters were here. And uh, the mother is living up uh, in Oroville, up on the Feather River. And, uh, so at any rate, no, it was still some busy. Okay, so let's go back here in, in uh, uh, Corsica now. Right, okay. Uh, and have you had 
you then assigned a plane, or, or tell me what, what happened after you well, got there. While we were coming across, I guess the pilots knew where we were coming. I didn't know where we were going. I knew we were going around to the oh. Mediterranean someplace. I didn't know what bomb group we were going to be assigned to or anything like that. And uh, so anyhow, we got settled in there for about three days, and I flew my I flew my first mission. So you got in there uh, the same day that the Battle of the Bulge started, uh, December 15th. And the first mission was against Genoa up north. December 15th. December 15th. Yeah. Then um, four, three or four days later, we, our next mission was against Pisa, which was northeast of us. Pisa, that where the leaning tower is. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. We stopped there too. Uh -huh. Did you see the tower? Do you recall seeing anything when you when you went? Mm -hmm. And um, then about uh, just about Christmas Day, long in there, we went back to Genoa again and bombed again. Um, How what was the uh, length of those missions? Oh golly, hour and a half, two hours, like that. Uh, one way. Oh. Any flak or do you call it contouring? Well, you always had flak. Uh, uh, we bombed from about seven to nine thousand feet. Uh, as a matter of fact, the guys weren't even carrying any oxygen on the airplane. A um, number of reasons for that. And if you don't need oxygen, don't carry it. Because if you get a piece of flak or a machine gun bolt in an oxygen tank and you get a fire, you got a bad problem. Um, that's what kills most of these people on civilian airlines is the oxygen system goes off. And the plane catches fire in the Fifty-eight. Um, yeah, we had we had flak. Uh, it takes about five missions before you get to be uh, kind of a veteran. And what do you do? You sit there and you think, what's going to happen? What would I do if this happened? You never wear your shoots. You had a you have a chest pack on, and it fastens on with two snaps. And it's what they call a D ring. And they call it D ring because it's shaped like a letter D. You pull the D-ring and it pops the, the pilot chute. And the pilot chute pulls the rest of the chute out. Um, but when you jump, you got to make sure you got that thing snapped on securely. I've talked to one guy here who was visiting a couple of years ago here. And he remembers jumping with only one hook snapped. And uh, he got down okay, but uh, that's kind of dangerous. Um, so we stayed above small arm burnout. Small arm burnout is about 3,000, 3,500 feet. And um, so when you're up around 7 to 900 feet or 9,000 feet, you have good visibility. Wind isn't bothering you too much. And uh, you can do a pretty good job laying the bombs in. Uh, do you, uh, do the, is it like the B-17 where they go on automatic pilot for the, the bombardier over yeah. the last uh, minute or two of the raid? Um, I was going to mention something. Um, you were talking about it took you about five missions to become a oh, veteran crew member, yeah. Okay. But you think of all the contingencies. What am I going to do if? And um, what what? Could, one thing is your, is your concern is can you get out of that escape hatch with that chest pack on? And uh, I guess you can. I never tried it. I did talk to one B-17 guy here who's a co-pilot. He said he couldn't get out the co-pilot window with his chute on, so he squeezed out, and as he fell away from the plane, he very carefully snapped it on and pulled the, the VQD ring, and he went on. Um, one th concern. Now, when you, you said the chest pack, um, th th is that separate from the parachute itself? Or? It has a, you have the harness on. Then on the chest pack, it's like a great big loaf of bread. It has two big, great big metal hooks on it, right. and you, you snap them on. Okay. Then. On the harness. Oh, you snap the the parachute onto your chest pack. Right. When you talk about chest pack, it's something that you attach the parachute to. Yeah, you have your harness on your parachute harness on. Oh, okay, so and, uh, so you got to remember to grab. Don't just you got to remember to put on, snap your. Okay. And, and you say sometimes or one time a guy just 
did it on one instead of both, and, and still made it. A good friend of mine, when I was at the U.S. Steel, Clyde Ireland, bailed out of over uh, Vienna, the B-15, uh, B-24, and uh, he said the bell went off to bail out, and uh, he said he reached down to get his chest pack, and he turned around, and he said he just saw the head of his other gunner going through the, the, the escape hatch, and his chest pack sitting on there. So uh, a veteran crew yeah. has thought exactly, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, and what sequence, and all that type of thing. If there's a fire, okay, I've got a fire extinguisher, where is it, how do I operate it, all that type of thing. You do that in training. But it takes nothing like the, the adrenaline rush of combat to really etch it into your mind. <coughs> Did you fly with the same crew all the time? No. That was different. We, we were, uh, mediums were different in the B-17s, uh, particularly in our outfit. This, uh, in B-17s, you had what they call crew integrity, when everybody knew their job and they cross-trained a lot of those jobs. Uh, I flew most of the time with one captain. Uh, I flew with uh, other officers, too. Other crews. Um, How many missions did you did you fly? On? I flew seventeen. Yeah. I flew three out of Corsica, and I flew uh, fourteen out of England. Oh, okay. So, okay. So after those three at Corsica, then where did you go to? The battle of the Bulge was on, and uh, the Germans were hiding their their trains in tunnels, and they needed planes to come in, and they were. Uh, the fighter bomber boys were doing a lot of this. They would drop a big bomb at the front of the tunnel and then at the other end of the tunnel and seal it in. Well, evidently, we had some some work to do, our squadron. So they sent our squadron up to Brighton um, in, uh, on the south coast of, of England, just uh, about 20 miles west of Beachy Head. Beachy Head, there's Hastings, um, then there's uh, Brighton's like a seaside resort. Yeah, it is, right, yeah. Pat does a docent here. He was born and raised in Brighton. Oh. Anyhow, we got up there, and uh, before we got operational, the, we had the Germans on the run. And uh, the missions I flew were coastal patrol, submarine, anti-submarine. Uh, Germans were still using some E-boats. That was a fast torpedo type uh, boat, equivalent to our PT boat. And, um, if you had a downed airman and didn't have cover for him, they would dash out in those e-boats and snag him up. Uh, but I don't know how many submarines they had operating in that channel, but uh, we never saw saw any. But the, a lot of the merchant vessels, their officers would call in and say they saw a periscope. And if so, and we'd have two or three planes ready and we'd roar off and, and go out and see if we could look for them, search them. Uh, we did a lot of work in Belgium. We did have one mission into Germany, and the last I had an opportunity to bomb Germany. I think that was my 11th mission, and we bombed Aachen, Germany, which Aachen, is just nice. A A A C H oh, yeah. uh, yeah. A A N. I think. Um, yeah, that was a bad show, and our infantry had to bypass Aachen finally. They couldn't couldn't take it. Finally gave up and just went around it. <coughs> But Mons, Belgium, um, Bruges, um, Liège, um, oh, Valley. Those are the types of. Uh -huh. And as I say, uh, Belgium is, is in the Low Countries. A lot of, uh, of uh, uh, transportation is done by waterway, and so we bombed uh, barge locks, uh, bombed. Uh, barges, any type of transportation. Uh, it's awful difficult to be effective in a waste position. You're taught in gunnery school to fire a maximum of six rounds. Boom, 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 boom. Well, an airplane traveling 200 miles an hour, and you're going, the co-pilot says, okay, you got a barge coming up on the right-hand side, it's about 150 yards out, uh, and you, you get all ready to go over here, and by, and by the time uh, he's there, and you go boom, 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 about like that. You fire about three or four rounds, and you hit the stop because you can't go any farther. There's a stop there that keeps you from yeah. shooting your own tail off. And uh, so I don't. I never saw an enemy aircraft in the entire time I was in the. Those are 50 calibers. Yeah, everything like that. No cannon. Nothing. 
not on the mic. No, the G and H models in cannons. One was a 75 millimeter, and they experimented with a 105 millimeter. I flew in a plane we, we, uh, on the uh, South Carolina coast where we were shooting at a beached uh, a tanker. And uh, that shell's about, golly, it's about that long. And, it, and the, the plane held 14 of them. And the cannon went down between the pilot and the co-pilot, and he stuck the shell in, and closed the breach, and the pilot aimed it, and then he fired. And then he op the co-pilot opened the breach and did the same thing. And uh, you could feel the jolt. It, it really jolted the airplane. And I guess that 105 millimeter canyon was just too much for the airplane. Uh, tell me about the, the radio that you used. Was it similar to the B7, the radio that's in the B7? Very similar to it, yeah. Command set, um, RIFF, identification friend or foe, uh, all that equipment, frequency regulator, um, uh, interplane equipment. Uh, radio operator's job changed when they brought out the, the 375 transmitter, and that gave the pilot more freedom and more capability to do the radio work than the radio man. Uh, you still had your key, and you still sent your strike uh, uh, codes back uh, by key. Uh, once you once you had your bombs away, and then you sent a five-letter and digit code back that said that it, 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 the bombs are away. And um, if the results were good, then you put a, what was it? Well, it was a code letter H or something like that on the end of it. If it was marginal, you put a, a B or a C or something on it. Um, but most of all was voice communication. We guarded the, the, home, fre the home frequency uh, in case there was a, a recall for one reason or another, weather or something like that. And um, did, did the radio, did the pilot all the voice stuff pretty much at the radio operator. No, he did. Too. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. 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 I had the magnetic compass. Stuff. This later on cost me to come to grief. How's that? Well, oh, this is I was back when I was in the States. I was involved in an airplane accident. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Well, let, let's finish up here, uh, this part when you're overseas. Uh, do you recall what your last mission was, or when it was? I think that was against uh, um, I think that was against the age, if I'm not mistaken, which is just west of, uh, of Aachen. And um, it was a standard bombing. Remember the date of that? It was in uh, April, I think April 3rd. And uh, so the VE day was, when was that? May 8th. Well, we came home before then. Oh, uh, so what was the circumstance? Had you, did, well, did you have so many missions you had to do, or how is it that you came back home? Uh, Really, they, they were always a little bit confused after we broke our bomb group up how to use us and where to use us and why. Did you have okay, all that of yeah, ragtag gypsies about, okay, the, what, was the, what was the bomb group you went 340. to? 340. 340. And were you a bomb uh, squadron? Was there another number before? Yeah, we had four squadrons. And Three, four, 349. 349. Uh -huh. okay. So... Tell me again about breaking up the, the, the Well, group. we weren't being used much, and uh, the guys were getting a little cranky. And uh, one day they said, you're going home. And uh, some of the guys took the airplanes home with them. Uh, they went back the same way we came. Um, and we came home in the, um, in the uh, transport. And um, actually, uh, the, uh, the uh, B-17 going back. And, um, we came to Mitchell Field, Long Island, and we were supposed then to come out to Mather Field, California, which is a B-25 refitting base, and uh, be refitted, pick up our new airplanes. The guys were supposed to meet us back there. And uh, then one day our CO, our squadron commander, was a good friend of the base commander at Maxwell Field, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. And he asked if I'd like to, to go with him down there to his, wanted, he wanted to deliver a puppy 
for as a birthday present for the base commander's son. And so we left about one o'clock in the afternoon. It was just four. It was pilot, co pilot, me, and a flight engineer. Had an uneventful trip down to Montgomery. And uh, that night, um, we decided to. That night we decided to go into Montgomery. I'll never forget that. And uh, got on the bus and uh, sat in some seats. Me and this uh, flight engineer, I think his name was Fritz Cerny. And um, no matter. We decided to go in and see the Capitol. The bus sat there and sat there, and we were, Cerny and I were talking. I looked up and I saw the bus driver looking at us, and there you go. The bus still didn't move, fine, the bus still, he's still looking at us. Finally he said, you white soldiers, he said, this bus don't move till you get out of nigger country. Segregation, right up against your face. So he got up and moved up the front of the bus, oh. and then he moved the bus. But behind the bar was for black people. We went into downtown Montgomery that night, and went to the state capitol, and uh, it was still pretty heavily adorned with Civil War ornaments and flags and things like that, cannon and that thing around it. But I do remember that going down the street walking, the black people would get off the sidewalk for you to walk by. And uh, I hadn't been exposed to that in California. I'd have been exposed a little bit to it, to it in, uh, in uh, Mississippi, but not much. But boy, that was, that was bad stuff. The next morning, um, we went off the flight line. We were going to leave about 10 o'clock. And we went off the flight line, and there were five B 25s had been there. And the plane next to us had taxied in and tied, and tied down about a half hour before uh, we got there. And the gas truck came down the line. And as he got to that plane, he, I, he did either did, didn't throw the grounding wire over it or he didn't ground it properly. And as soon as he touched the hose to the airplane, it blew up. And of course it killed all them, burnt the airplane, and it cocked our airplane way up over on the side like that. So it had to be checked out and finally about... Did you see this happen? No. About um, five o'clock, uh, most happened about half an hour before we got there. About five o'clock, um, we were ready to go again. It was getting dark. And um, there was a line of thunder storms had come in. In, uh, in the Virginias. And so we, we decided to go to go ahead and take off. And uh, I guess the pilot thought it was okay to go either under him or over him or around him or something. He didn't try to go around him. But he took off in the evening? In was the it evening. nighttime like? No, it was getting dark though. And by the time we got out there, the first hour it was dark. Anyhow, uh, it got awful dark. You hear the rain begin to pelt down in the airplane. and. Uh, we lowered our altitude, and um, then we began to have trouble. We began to pick up ice. All I could get on the radio was static. I couldn't get anything. We were on the, had been steering uh, on the radio, the Roanoke radio range. And uh, it got louder and louder, and, and uh, we lost the right engine. Uh, choked up with ice or whatever happens to engines. So we were on one engine, and then I heard this Real bad scraping on the bottom of the airplane. The next I knew that we were going down in an apple orchard, about 20 miles southwest of Roanoke. And a B-25, it's a, one of its big fuselage weaknesses. It has a tendency to doesn't have a tendency almost always breaks in half right behind the trailing edge of the wing. Well, that's my office, and it threw me out into the into the apple orchard and saved my life. Well, okay, okay. Tell me that. What happened now? It broke. It breaks a, a B-25 breaks in half about right there. I think that's where the two fuselage sections are joined. And it broke in half. And it threw me out in the orchard and saved my life because I was the only survivor. And uh, about four days later, I woke up in Old Katomit Hospital in Mitchell Field, Long Island, in a full body cast with a shattered pelvis and broken back and various and sundry other cuts and bruises around the head and what have you. I stayed there 11 months in uh, 
most of the time in that same room. The you woke board. up in, in, the, in Mitchell Field, did you say? Old Catonment Hospital. That's right. Mitchell Field, Long Island. That's where you yeah, yeah. got The room I was in had wallboard in the ceiling. And it had 43 nails going across it that way and 53 nails going down that way. And day after day, I, I watched those nails and counted them one way or another and tried to play mathematical games on them. After about two months, it took now, the you test. Had, what you had, what you say, a broken pelvis? Oh, my pelvis was shattered. And uh, my three bottom caudal vertebrae were broken. I had no compound fractures. My left arm was broken. My left leg was broken. Um, I had a bad cut in the top of my head. Um, both my eyes were, were black and my nose was broken. I lost some teeth over here. Uh, it, it wasn't a it wasn't a nice landing. No, no. Who found you? Uh, I had no you idea. The civilians did, or I imagine civilians did. Some farmer probably uh, said, "There's something in my orchard coming here." <laughs> yeah. And you said that was southwest of Rona? Southwest of Rona. Yeah, it's not too far from my wife. Grew up uh, west of Rona, about mm -hmm. 40 or 50 miles. Oh. Of the, you ever been back to that area at all? No, I have. Roy June crashed in that area. Yeah, he told Blacksburg, I think. Yeah, yeah that's right. which is close by yeah. there. Yeah, that's right. So, so for 11 months then, you were I was in the hospital. Nails. And then they wanted me to, uh, to uh, uh, they wanted to give me a disability discharge. They gave me a 40% disability pension. And uh, I said I would not take a disability discharge. Well, the review was if I could go back to active duty for 90 days, then they would give me a regular honorable discharge. And so my high school principal was uh, a mess officer up at West Point, New York, at the United States Military Academy. Yeah, well, not actually at the academy, it was at Stewart Field, which is in Newburgh, which was their flying field. So he said, well, come on, I'll get you up here. And uh, he said, you can help me around making up broken dishes reports or stuff like that for 90 days, and then we'll get you a regular discharge. And so in November 1946, I was discharged at Fort Dix, New Jersey along with the famous 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the DCs. They were going through discharge at that time. Tough outfit. <clears throat> and I came home, hitchhiked home, and uh, I got home Thanksgiving Day. And uh, the family was at Visalia, watching the Tulare Visalia football game. My brother Ed was playing fullback for Tulare. Nobody was home. I went in. I took my uniform off. I hung it on a hanger very carefully. Put on a pair of Levi's and a shirt, my old boots. And never put that uniform on again. And I left that page of my life behind me. It was Thanksgiving Day, 1923. And the reason I can't remember the date is because I had some terminal pay coming, and um, the official date of discharge was different than that. Maybe I think that was November 23rd. Would have been 1946. Uh, 1946. Yeah. So I was in the service 28 months. Um, obviously, it sounds like somewhat like your father, you were changed person when you came home, and it sounds like it was more the crash that did it as opposed to the combat itself, would you say, or, or what? I don't know. You know I've read uh, uh, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. Right. It wasn't the war that made an impression on me, it was the depression. 
and the suffering of those poor people from Oklahoma, they call them Okies and what have you. Uh, that, I think, that made the biggest impact on me. Um, the war, I knew pretty much what it was going to be about. Um, I did my job. I was lucky to come home. And uh, put it behind you and get the GI Bill and go to college and get married and raise a family and get a job and, and uh, forget about it. So let's start off with that then. Uh, okay, you're, you're back. Did you go back to college initially or what? Yeah, I did. Or I, went to I went to college. I went to Visegi Junior College. GI Bill? GI Bill. Uh, public Law 16. That's a disabled veterans bill. A little bit more lucrative than Public Law 346, which was the regular GI Bill. And uh, in my second year, I was elected to student body president. And um, I. Um, didn't, uh, I didn't know anybody to speak of. I didn't date one girl, but it was just kind of a frivolous thing. And uh, I spotted this girl that, that was the most vivacious, prettiest uh, girl on campus, and I named her this, to the social committee. And the end of that year, we got married. <laughs> Getting married. Okay, you were you're on the GI Bill and uh, attending Visalia JC. Okay, and you met this vivacious young lady. Was that the, was I recall? Named Dixie Kirby. That's right. Uh -huh. And uh, I was being the student body president. I had the right to appoint people, so I appointed her to the social committee. At the end of that year, we got married. Where uh, where was she from? I uh, said. What did her uh, family do? Uh, her dad was uh, the manager of city maintenance, and her mother was an officer in title insurance and trust. Uh -huh. So, well, she was going to school then, also, yes. right? So, did you both finish school then, or what? Yes, after we got out of junior college, then we went to San Jose State. graduated from San Jose State in 1951, and um, she didn't graduate from college until about five years later, and um, she became a specialist in mentally gifted minors, a teacher, and she taught 32 years exclusively with the mentally gifted kids all over the United States. <clears throat> I'm very proud of her, very, very good teacher. Uh, what age groups are we talking about? She generally specialized in the fifth to sixth group. Uh -huh. So these were the real bright kids. Mm -hmm. uh, so did she have to travel some to do that? Or? No. Uh, she taught in five different school systems around the United States. Oh, so you, I, when you moved around? I was, yeah, I was transferred oh, around okay. in corporate life. Uh -huh. right okay. So what was your major then? Uh, Started out pre law, and went to anthropology, ended up psychology. But basic, basic uh, major. Uh -huh. And so, what did you do after you graduated then? I uh, went to work for Westinghouse in Sunnyvale as an industrial relations training. And um, in those days, the uh, management training programs were fairly rudimentary. And Westinghouse had one that was very much like Standard Oil, where you started out on that loading dock wrestling 50 gallon oil drums and uh, I worked in transformer assembly, I worked in uh, tool crib, uh, I worked on a, on a separate program called N37 and that was a top secret navy gun we were building and uh, one of the proudest things I've ever done was about a month before I left Westinghouse to join U.S. Steel uh, they gave me my journeyman machinist card. Uh -huh. I'm very proud of that. 
do like to work with my hands. And uh, I worked for Westinghouse in that program about three years. And then I joined U.S. Steel out at uh, Pittsburgh Works, which is a big integrated uh, works out in east of San Francisco yeah. on the uh, Stockton uh, uh, San Francisco Deep Water Ship Channel. We had about 6,000, 6,500 employees. I started off there as an employment man, and uh, then I became uh, the training director, and then I worked in uh, organization planning. It kind of moved me all around. Uh, I guess I'm jumping the gun a little bit. While I was at Westinghouse, I uh, was accepted uh, for um, a program at um, Stanford's Graduate School of Business. And um, so I switched to night shift, and I went to Stanford in the daytime. And uh, before I, uh, I uh, left Westinghouse, I had gotten my MBA. And um, then went to work for uh, U.S. Steel in December of 19. 54. We lived in Concord, California. And I worked for them for about 15 years. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Pittsburgh, you were working, where Where were you? Where you were? Pittsburgh is about. Yeah, no, 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 I know, but were you working for Westinghouse then? Or no, I was working for U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel, yeah. okay. No, but, but you said Concord? Did you? Concord's where we lived. Oh, Which you lived in Concord? Concord. Oh, okay. I was active in civic affairs in Concord. I was chairman of the personnel board. That's on the uh, the open side too. Of yeah, the, the, what uh, Herb Game would call the mysterious East Bay. <laughs> uh -huh. As chairman of the personnel board, I had the interesting experience of firing the chief of police, which was uh, interesting. As I say, the Concord chief of police. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what what were the circumstances of that? Well, one night I got a call at home, and uh, it was from one of the captains, and he asked me if I'd come over to his house. And I went over there, well, there was 17 of the 18 senior officers all sitting around the living room. And uh, I wouldn't want anybody in the public to hear this, because it's uh, still, anyhow. No, no, I, I, they said, um, we've, got, we've got a uh, 19 felonies against the chief. And there were stupid things. Concord had grown very rapidly, and he had been a sergeant on the Pittsburgh Police Department. And um, he was a very able man, except that, I guess, power corrupted or familiarity bred contempt. And there were little things like recovering carpenter saws, saws that were stolen from the construction site. The insurance company paid the contractor, and then he took the saws and gave them around to all his friends. Or taking um, automobiles, and declaring them fully uh, totaled, paying the $25 fee to the state of California and giving the cars away to various and sundry people. And it just went on and on. And any crime in excess of $200 in those days was a felony. And they had him cold. And uh, my uncle was the attorney general uh, of the state of California. And they said, if you don't get his resignation tomorrow, by noon tomorrow, we have a, an appointment with your uncle and we're going to open this can up, this town up like a can of worms. And so uh, I met him at the Presbyterian Church because I wanted to be on the proper psychological ground. But Dan Boatwright, I think Dan is still a state senator, and another fellow, told him that uh, what had happened. And he said, well, well, my officers have lost confidence in me. And I told him I resigned. He took a piece of paper and resigned. And I, drove up to the police academy up on the hill, and I could, those guys almost cried. They couldn't believe that they had finally done this. Then they asked me to, to head the interviewing board to select the new chief of police, which I did, and cured the problem. Going back to my U.S. Steel days, I spent most of my time there as a uh, lead in labor relations. And uh, being a journeyman machinist, I could relate to those guys. And uh, I knew what their value structure was and what things that were important to them were. And I knew how they operated. Uh, and uh, so I was very good at it and it was very effective. And I became involved in, with the negotiations for the, with the basic steel companies. Uh, in 1957 or 1959, I can't remember, we took a 116-day strike for the whole 13 steel companies. 
uh, we didn't overwork rules because the United Steel workers were just strangling us. The Japanese and the Germans were developing new steel making processes and we were stuck with the old ones and we had to get out from one of those work, work, work rules or we give up the steel industry. And uh, Dick Nixon, Richard Nixon was vice president under Eisenhower and so Eisenhower told him to settle the strike and he came in and said, if you don't settle this now, we're going to place our orders on foreign mills. And that left us no choice and we settled the strike. But uh, I learned a lot about labor relations. And then in 1969, I guess it was, I was recruited uh, by Hergen Rather and Company to join the Whitaker Corporation and uh, to head up their labor relations for their industrial and commercial metals group, their architectural products group, and their technical products group, three of their five major groups. What did they make? Well, they were one of the budding conglomerates. They made just about everything including pleasure boats. Outside of Chris Craft, they had a uh, pleasure boat market here in the United States. Uh, we had a tremendous steel distribution industry, architectural products, what have you. I had 69 unions that I was responsible for nationwide. And uh, I never would sit down at the bargaining table with those people, but I would go in and I would... Um, I would uh, uh, well, so you were... You were management or labor or in between? No, I was a manager. Oh, okay. I would uh, meet with the local management and tell them how to negotiate. And then if it was a big negotiations, I'd take a hotel room down the hall someplace. And um, labor negotiations, you're, you're, you're negotiating against a time frame, and that's a strike deadline. And so you get into a lot of theatrics and uh, you're stalling for time, you want to come right up against that strike deadline before things start falling off the table and you know whether you're going to get an agreement or not. And you play various games, you act like you're going to put the plant under siege and you bring in cots and sleeping bags and you cre create a uh, security schedule for the managing employees and you discreetly leak that to some first line foreman that you know leak it to the union. And, um, when the, when the union presents you with certain demands, well, you've got to make the union guy look good in front of these people because he's elected. And so you've got to do things like slam your briefcase and shut it up and say, manage a caucus, and you storm out of the room and you go down and play bridge or poker for four or five hours, and you come back with a long face and you say, oh, we pencil this thing out. We just can't do it. And you, you play that type of game. And uh, you send a letter to the wife saying, uh, if you're a strike, then we'll pay your, your health and welfare insurance for 30 days, and then you, you have to pay for it, or your family's going to be uncovered. You know, sight games like shrink games. I became very, very good at it. I contracted out the West Coast companies uh, to Paul R. Rake and Company, which is a professional negotiating company, and uh, I practically lived on the East Coast and in the Southwest. And um, what were, Where were some of the places that you lived? Uh, what I mean, I would go out Sunday night, I'd go out on that 315 TWA flight to wherever I was going, and then I'd come home Friday night. That was the deal I had with Whitaker. I had four sons, and my wife was a teacher, and they needed dad home. They turned out to be superb boys, but they always knew that dad would call home, and uh, that dad would be home that weekend. And unless I was really caught in a bad labor action, I would be home. I became kind of an expert on, on uh, work stoppages and strikes. And uh, you don't lose, you don't win a strike, but conversely, I lost very few. And by that, I mean you bring the union to heel and you punish the strike perpetrators. And you sue the union for lost productivity and that type of thing if you want to. If you don't sue them, you file the suit, and then comes contract negotiation time, you trade the suit for a good contract. And um, I became so well known that uh, in 1973, I was recruited by Ward Howell and Company, one of the top flight executive search firms, uh, who was representing the Nixon administration, to come to Washington and negotiate the first labor agreements with the first four Postal Service unions. Um, Ted Klassen was the, was the Postmaster General. And um, uh, Nelson Rockefeller was vice president. 
in those situations like that, you have a political boss and then you have an operating boss. My political boss was the vice president, my operating boss was the postmaster general. And um, those, were, those were interesting negotiations. I remember the three of us going in there, there was 105 guys on the other side of the table. 105. And their contract demands totaled more than five billion dollars. And uh, at any rate, after the contract negotiations, then I was asked to stay on and train the various units on how to administer the contract. And then I was asked to stay ahead of personnel administration for the Postal Service. And um, my charter was, we had, one of the first questions I asked in the Postal Service was, how many, how many employees do we have? You know, they couldn't tell you. They had somewhere between 1.3 million employees and about a million. And the reason for it was back in Appalachia and places like that, they had a little fourth class post office. They had a postmaster and they had a rural carrier and they had a clerk. Uh, when the rural carrier got sick and his wife took his crowd over, the postmaster paid her out of ca petty cash. There was no record of that. But they darn sure plugged her in for her benefits. So there was a benefit run and then there was a wage run. And both of them were about 300,000 employees off. Um, this was more employees than any any of the of the military services except the U.S. Army, and uh, it was uh, it was a tough job. We had employees in uh, in uh, Gary, Indiana, that were working two hours a day and getting paid for eight. We had employees in San Jose that regularly worked 10 to 12 hours uh, a day. Four hours plus two to four hours overtime. So I went to a man named Androwski, who was head of the Civil Service Commission in Washington, and I went to him and I said, You've got to allow me the right to transfer these employees or offer them the opportunity to go. And being a private sector person, that's just what you do. But in the public sector, that's unheard of. And I would issue what you call an adverse action to transfer a person from, in this case, from Gary to San Jose it would come back fatally defective. That means if there was a period, a comma, or anything like that out of there, then it was fatally defective and I couldn't reappeal it. If it was procedurally defective, then I could reappeal again. And it would come back fatally defective. So I went in to see Mr. Androwski. And Mr. Androwski was a fairly heavy man. He must have had 15 pounds of gold jewelry on him. Now, at those salaries you pay in the federal government, I'm just not saying he may have been a gold collector. I don't know. Uh, but he said, well, I can't do it. And I said, if you can't do it, then I'm going to the press. And uh, he said, you wouldn't do that. And I said, try me. And so he approved it. And on that basis, then, by the time I left the Postal Service, I reduced their workforce down to about 676,000 employees. And uh, I put in the bulk mail centers all over the country, 36 of them staffed them, or saw their training. Uh, I acted as an administrative law judge. All adverse actions brought against Postal Service management employees came to me for final adjudication. I never forget one case where um, they wanted to suspend this postmaster in Texas, in a small town, because he wouldn't fly the United States flag, he'd fly the Texas flag. And uh, so I, I approved the suspension for a month, and after he got hit in the pocket for a month, he decided the U.S. flag wasn't that shabby looking after all. <laughs> and I uh, had another case where a postmaster, and a, she was operating a grocery store, and the other half of the grocery store was a post office, and there was a door between. And uh, she would, this, in this particular case, this woman came in and sold her, after a very heart-rending tale, uh, food stamps. And I thought, how can they discipline this postal postmaster? She's a federal employee. She's trying to help this poor woman. And I get down to the last half page of this uh, treatise about three quarters of an inch thick, and I find the postmaster, her mistress, had been paying a nickel on the dollar for the food stamps. <laughs> so it was interesting, but uh, I, uh, I had very I had, I had uh, the Postal Service the medical department. I had five major hospitals around the United States, uh, 258 physicians, occupational medical men, about 6,500 nurses, and um, it was a, an interesting uh, medical op op operation. I, uh, 
had a um, program for alcoholic recovery. In every major post office above 100 employees, they have a unit for alcoholic recovery. It's an excellent program. And I wanted to ask you, uh, when you were in these negotiations, uh, especially with unions and especially out of the private sector sort of, were you ever fearful that uh, harm would come to you or to your family from, from disgruntled union type people? Well, I remember one night when two, two pipe fitters came to our house. Uh, I think they'd been drinking. Um, it scared my wife. Uh, I remember another instance where I was negotiating in Houston, Texas, and they sent my wife a uh, pair of panties with a little note from this lady in them. Um, she understood. She knew what was happening. Uh, I was in a big strike with um, Bishop Tube in Malvern, Pennsylvania, outside of Valley Forge, you know, where I'd fired four guys. And we, we were out for about six months on that and uh, ended up in federal mediation downtown Philadelphia for several uh, weeks. And I had to change my hotel room every night because they were following me to where I was staying. And um, I'd been run off the road and had a lot of things happen. I never told my wife about it. She had a demand that I... I remember one time when I was with U.S. Steel, we were struck by the longshoremen. They wanted... The issue was, do we own the U.S. Do we do U.S. Steel employees unload U.S. Steel ships on our property, on that Stockton, San Francisco, deep water ship channel, or do the Harry Bridges longshoremen do it? And... Um, Every 17 days, we would bring a new ship from Sparrows Point, Pennsylvania, around or Delaware, around through the locks and into San Francisco Bay. And those guys would meet us with a flotilla of about 40 or 50 small craft. They just they'd escort our boat up to the docks at Pittsburgh Works, and then they would get in between the, the big boat and the dock. When they try to throw hawsers to aboard their dock or ship, they'd take an axe and cut them in two. And I put an end to that by bringing the fire department. We had about seven big uh, pieces of equipment in the fire department and took two pumpers there. And they pumped enough water into it where they were washed to the gunnels and they backed out. But um, the master's mates and pilots who ran the ship were warring with the longshoremen. It took them about 24 hours to unload the ship. And then they would wait for the next tide and they would take a broom and climb up their mast and they would turn the broom upside down and tie it to the mast. Well, in seamen's parlance, that meant clean sweep fore and aft. And that just drove those longshoremen crazy. And they would escort the ship back out the bay again. And um, about 4,000 of them formed up in downtown, or around the plant. And uh, we tried to serve an injunction, and we didn't know who was who. And finally, the sheriff stood on the top of a car with a bullhorn and served the, and served the injunction. They wouldn't obey it. He wasn't going to enforce the law. He only had about 200 deputies. And um, so we called Dave McDonald, who was head of the United States U.S. Steel Workers at the time. said, Mr. McDonald, these are your jobs you're fight that we're fighting for you. And we don't give a damn who unloads that boat. We just want it unloaded. If you want the jobs, you come down and take care of these people. And he formed up about 5,000 steel workers in Pittsburgh with baseball bats and pick handles. They marched on the mill. Longshoremen scattered and never did come back. Another time, I was in charge of plant security. Uh, I took off about 5 o'clock in the morning to get to the plant. I had to be inside the plant. We had radios, walkie-talkie radios and stuff like that, and I had my people all around. And uh, But I had to get in the plant. And these guys were about every 10 feet apart around the periphery of the plant. But I did see a, a, a railroad cut that came in from downtown Pittsburgh, and finally as it went across this barley field, Barty Field fell away, and um, you could see the railroad track. So I got underneath the fence, and I started walking. And I got out there about 150, 175 yards, and I began to see if they could see me. I, was, uh, I, was, I wasn't going to, uh, to bend over. I wasn't going to run or anything like that. Damn it, I was going to be dignified. I was a management man, and I had the right to get in that plant. And I could hear them start coming running after me. And longshoremen are all built about the same way. They're about five feet wide and about five feet tall. And they have these cargo hooks in their hip pocket lined with leather. They can flick a fly off your sleeve without blinching or without flinching. And 
and I could hear them puffing and running behind me. I looked ahead of me, and here's a car, and there's three guys standing there with their coats open, and each of them has a pistol in his belt. I thought, oh God, here I am between, this. they've got me, they've got me there and they've got me behind. And I thought, well, there's probably a hundred people watching me, and I'm not going to disgrace you, I steal. And uh, I didn't quicken my pace or anything, but I did change the direction. I was walking toward the wire mill, and I switched my direction to the rod mill about another quarter of a mile down. When I did that, they got in their car and they drove down to the rod mill to intercept me. Well, I kept going. I thought, boy, John, you're going to get beaten into a bloody mess here. And I got about 25 feet from them, and uh, they said, we're from the ship. And what had happened, uh, one of the, the first mate, I think it was, had gone into town the previous night. The longshoreman caught him, broken his collarbone and one arm, and prop left him propped up against the lamppost during the middle of the night. And uh, they were darn sure that they weren't going to get a hold of me. <laughs> that was a, a big relief, oh. and uh, then I, uh, I was uh, another strike we had. I was out in the middle of the people, and that was very foolish. I wanted to see what they were talking about. The next thing I knew, I was looking at the seating of an ambulance, and somebody had cracked me over the head with a piece of an iron bar. Where was this? This was in Pitt, Pittsburgh, Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, what was the circumstance again? What was going on there? Uh, I can't remember what the issue was. I mean, you were. But I, I wanted to get out and get around the, the strikers and listen to them oh. and, and see what they were going to say, what they were saying. And when I did, somebody popped me over the head. And um, so, anyway, this was a rough game. And talk about the labor business forever, but uh, I was privileged to be involved in it in the tough days, and it was a muscle business. I uh, negotiated with the Mafia, Chicago Industrial yeah. Workers, well, they're not so bad. I met with them at uh, O'Hare Airport in the red carpet room, that United uh, room, and a uh, young fellow who was representing the union, he had his muscle there. His muscle looked like Lon Chaney in the mice and men, he had his, his heat on out there and, and uh, we talked for a little bit and, and uh, I knew the plant it had about a thousand employees and I knew it was divided into three racial groups Hispanic white and black and I knew that they were fairly well divided so I knew he really didn't have a lot of traction with these people so I said well what's it going to take this to settle this and he said well we'll need 25 cents at 25 cents an hour I said oh my god I said I tell you 21 cents is the best we could possibly do he said, well, let's see what we can do. That told me that we had a contract at 23 cents. So I went back and told him and the local manager people how to behave. Sure enough, comes midnight, 30 days later, got the contract at 23 cents. Uh, he didn't want to strike, and uh, we didn't want the mess on our hands. The one incident that I remember was, it was a company called Yardley Electronics in New York. I was merging them with Courier Communications just outside of Newark Airport on Highway 2 in either Union or Springfield, New Jersey, New Jersey, I can't remember. And we were negotiating far into the night, long about 2 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from Los Angeles. And it was a boss, and he said, John, he said, we've decided not to merge the two companies. So, end of big problems. I go back in the room and I said, guys, the company of Whitaker has decided not to merge the companies. Union guy says, what? And I said, yeah, so we decided not to merge the companies. The next day was Sunday, and Sunday we were going to start transferring the yardage material over to the current communication company. He said, now use a phone. And I said, sure. So I went and saw him use the phone. He came back. I said, what was the big customer? Well, he said, um, just to make sure that uh, you guys understood our position, he said, uh, we had all your trucks wired with two sticks of 20 powder dynamite. It also wired my car with two sticks of 20 powder. So I came that close to having a foot or an ankle broken, blown off by those guys. Those were the fun days. Now that's, this is all handled generally by, by females and they do a very good job and, and you don't have this type of violence and the public is against this type of violence. So that's kind of the, too much of that. Yeah. <laughs>
And that's all about all I can tell you about the Postal Service. I did resign in 1970. At the end of 1976, I resigned and came home. Uh, I'm not a private sector guy. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not a public sector guy. And I just wasn't used to the psyche of a public employee. Uh, they're dear people, and God love them. A lot of them are what they call double dippers. They're retired military people with 30 years. And then they they, they become what they call preference eligible. That's government T's for, we'll give you five points on your on your test if you're a veteran. If you're a disabled veteran, we'll give you 10 points. So I was a 10 point preference eligible. But at any rate, um, um, don't stand in front of the elevator at 8 o'clock in the morning. You get stampeded. Yeah. Don't stand in the elevator at 5 o'clock in the evening. Well, in the private sector, you did your job seven days a week, 12, 15 hours a day until the job was done. That's what you got paid for. I never could quite get used to that. We'd be in a meeting and some guy would say, well, 5 o'clock, got my ride pool, got to go. And out he'd go. And, and he'd tear the meetings up. And uh, so anyhow, I came back to the private sector. My dad had died in office. He was in politics. He died in office. What, what, okay. What did he do in politics? Your dad dad was, uh, was on the State Board of Equalization, the second equalization district. And um, a lot of people don't know what that is, but when California was set up in 1850, it had four senatorial districts. Each district had a, had a tax equalization member because you had a big gold rush going on over in Placerville and that places. Down in Los Angeles, it was different. Uh, and to equalize tax policy throughout the state of California, you had a member of the Board of Equalization who was a constitutional officer, just like a, a controller or the vice president or the president. And he sat in each senatorial district. As the state grew, you got more state senators, but the number of equalization members remained the same. And there are four members of the Board of Equalization, and the fifth man is a state controller. In those days, it was Alan Cranston. Uh, anyhow, Dad was elected to that office. And uh, for 17 of those 21 years, he was the chairman of the State Board of Equalization. After he got out of the oil business, he went with the Bureau of Internal Revenue, which became the IRS. And uh, he knew tax law, where the rest of them were more politicians, good guys, but you know, politicians. But he died in office, and uh, I had a terminally ill stepmother in Fresno. So we moved back to Fresno to settle his estate. And while I was there, uh, the utility companies found I was back in California. And um, what, what year was this? This was 1977. Uh, 1977. So they came to Fresno and said, if we put up the money, will you run for your dad's position? And I said, well, I've been a pretty much, uh, ever since I was with U.S. Steel, a Republican. And I said, we had an old saying in U.S. Steel, it's right out of the Bible. Whose bread I eat, his song I sing. And I said, uh, I'd have to become a Democrat again. So I talked to the family, and they said, well, what would have happened if I'd won that election? I would have had a staff of five, an office in Sacramento, an office in Fresno. I'd had two deputies, three clerical people. and." Uh, it's like a, an attorney who steps out of his law firm to take a job in politics. He, in fact, then becomes the rainmaker, so to speak, for his law firm, and that would have happened to me. So it was well worth the gamble. So I decided to go for it. And on 76, 78, I, I campaigned for the Board of Equalization. And I lost. I lost narrowly. But nevertheless, I did lose. And uh, I had opened my consulting firm in Fresno. When I lost there, I didn't want to create the bow wave in Fresno. They really didn't understand my business. So I came down to Orange County and moved down to Newport Beach and lived there for, I think it was 18 years until we moved out here uh, to the desert. My business, uh, J.D. Lynch and Associates, was a senior level executive search firm uh, supplying senior managers and key technical specialists to the discrete program industry for the Air Force, Army, and anti-submarine warfare business for the Navy. I had a letter of clearance, security clearance. And, uh, discrete, you discrete what? Discrete programs. These are, these are jammers, uh, um, uh, frequency uh, 
microwave, integrated circuits, and all that type of stuff. Um, it's the interesting business. I remember when Gary Powers was shot down. Uh, we were in Mod 21 on that jammer, and we realized that our jammer had been compromised. So then we would make a change to it, and then we would wait to see how long it took the Russians to catch up. And we found out that they had changed their their equipment, and we back changed our again, ours again. It was back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. But um, I got got involved in some very interesting programs that way, and uh, is one reason why uh, I uh, got involved with the, with the Air Force. The Air Force was my prime, uh, most of the major primes were my customers. The Air Force was really one of my prime uh, clients. I joined the Air Force Association. I was president of the Newport Beach, or Curtis Lee May chapter. I became state president of the California Air Force Association. And then I became national vice president of the Air Force Association. And uh, some of my people I placed were general officers that were retiring from the Air Force going with civilian companies. And uh, I traveled quite frequently with the Air Force as a full colonel because that way I could stay on base and base housing and I could, uh, nobody asked any questions. If the general called and said Colonel Lynch is going to make reservations for Colonel Lynch or Colonel Lynch is going to be on your airplane, nobody asked any questions. And it just made it a lot easier. And a very interesting experience. Uh, the Air Force Association and I were, were very close and, and uh, are still very close. Um, I say we lived in Newport Beach. Um, Where did you live in Newport Beach? In, in, in what they call East Bluff. Yes. Uh, one of our neighbors uh, was uh, General LeMay, Curtis LeMay, and his wife Helen. And um, I um, got to know him quite well. Took him and Helen to the Air Force Ball uh, several times. Uh, he was always active in our chapter. We had uh, annual installation of officers and things like that. Just a great guy. Um, in 1970, I'm trying to think, 1990, I guess, was I was named Man of the Year for the Air Force Association, which I was proud of. Um, I could have gone ahead and become president, but I didn't feel that uh, there were so many guys that had some great, well, we had guys like Gabby Gabreski. Guys like uh, Jenny Doolittle, uh, these guys had been president before me. I mean, who, uh, who in the heck was I, with 28 years service, to step in uh, to their shoes? And uh, so um, I decided not to not to run. Um, the Cold War was just winding down, about 1990, 1991. My business was being was being severely impacted. Contracts were being canceled. Money was harder to get. But I had run into a lot of fellas who had money. So my partner, I, Ted Gillen Waters, um, TR was a colonel on the attorney, he was a colonel on MacArthur's staff, and uh, General MacArthur's staff. And he and I started a company called Clarity Capital Corporation. He owned a mine in Arizona called the Clarity Mine. And so we applied that to our company and we became Clarity Capital. And we specialized in aviation financing. We financed Transworld Express, which was a shared designator or a, what, what, what is a commuter airline for, tra for TWA. Uh, we surfaced, serviced feed or furnished feed from 19 Southern California cities to LAX using uh, otters and uh, sold that business to uh, uh, a man in Newport Beach, a wealthy man. Um, got involved in various and sundry. I did a lot of work for Gordon Cooper, who was uh, one of the original uh, seven astronauts. And uh, he had a program, it was a, a um, re-engineering uh, of uh, modifying of light twin aircraft. And um, oh, I can't remember some of the pro other programs around there. So many of them fell out of bed. Um, but at any rate, uh, I kind of tired of that. Uh, I financed a company called Plastics Research in Santa Fe Springs. It turned out to be a very key uh, client of mine. As a matter of fact, I negotiated their last labor agreement for them. And um, then we moved out here in 1994 when Dixie retired. And um, um, I closed my businesses about 1996. 
and we became involved in the museum here. To go back, Dixie and I had four sons. Um, Ted is a sales manager in, uh, for a uh, computer company in Austin. Um, his wife is a vice president of marketing for one of the uh, compact computer divisions. My uh, son Dan is in the security business in Detroit. His wife's a registered nurse. My son Dave, my youngest son, is a, a flight officer for uh, America West Airlines. His wife's a teacher in Corona. And my oldest son was warrant officer and killed in action in Vietnam in, on January 5, 1971. We had no daughters. And, uh, we have nine grandchildren, five granddaughters who completely wrapped me around their little finger, and four grandsons, of which I'm very proud. Your oldest son was his name John? Also. John. He was John W. Lynch III, and, and John W. Lynch IV now is four, four years old. He was uh, in the Army? He was an Army warrant officer, yeah. same as Gene, Gene Ramirez. Do you want to talk anything about what happened to him in Vietnam? Well, he was flying uh, assault uh, helicopters out of Pleiku at Camp Holloway, and um, we don't know really much except that he was suppressing hostile fire in a hot landing zone, they call it an LZ, and uh, a shoulder launched rocket. So he just blew his tail off and he killed the whole, fly all five of them. It wasn't a clean thing, and I went to Fort McNair and tried to find out what really happened. And they said that he was under security blanket for eight years. His helicopter outfit, the 52nd and two others, the 189th and another one. And uh, I don't know, finally I just got tired of chasing it down. I thought about writing to the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association, but I don't want to bring up any old ghosts or anything. Everybody on board with the Yeah, okay. And the debate was his remains sent home? Well, what was left of him, you know, this, you get these telegrams, and one says, you know, the aircraft did not burn. And the next one says, the aircraft did burn. And he didn't know, the aircraft did not burn. So who gives a damn if it burns if there's nothing left of the body? And by law, the body has to come back to the United States. It came back to Oakland. Then I asked that he'd be buried in the uh, National Military Cemetery of the Pacific, the Punch Bowl in Honolulu. And that's where he, uh, he is now. How, how did you choose that spot? I was following United Flight and I was looking at one of their monthly magazines, and there was an article on the, on the Punch Bowl Cemetery. How pleasant it was and how most of the veterans who were killed in the Pacific Wars were buried up there and what have you. And, and um, I, uh, I requested to be buried there with full military honors, which met up the band and the whole deal. And, and uh, they put on quite a dog and pony show and that always made me suspicious. He was awarded the Bronze Star Medal uh, for valor on the field. And uh, I thought, you know, Maybe it should have been the Silver Star or something like that. I don't know. Uh, uh, was the Bronze Star for a specific uh, engagement? Yes, for that engagement. For that particular yeah, for one. Okay, okay, okay. Fire. Yeah. 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 Right now, I'm helping my oldest grandson. He's taking writing lessons in Austin. And he was in a writing show, and everybody was in dressage. And he wanted to dress like Grandpa with his boots and his spurs and his hat. And uh, he used to work livestock. As a matter of fact, in the summer times, I worked for the packing companies up out of Mineral King. I worked for Ray Buckman's Mineral King Packing Company as a packer, packing fishing and hunting parties in the High Sierras and Mount Whitney and the Kern Basin. And then the next year, I managed the Silver City Packing Company for Otis Brown. And um, we, two took parties back in there. And uh, so I gave him a few pointers on what, that. Was, when, was that when you were going to college? Yeah, right, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, I did a little bit of that in high school, too. Uh, so 
So how old is he, your grandson? He is uh, TJ. TJ is ten. And how did you get involved in the Air Museum here? Uh, my wife Dixie. She was getting involved in the Living Desert, and she said, "Why don't you go down to the Air Museum? I see they're they're beginning to get docents together." So I did, and I joined October, the month before we opened in 1996. And uh, I've enjoyed it ever since. I served as a membership chairman under Gene Hawley when he was a president. And I wrote the, the docent training program and installed it, and was the training chairman for a number of years until I um, took a sabbatical uh, earlier this year. I'm kind of a museum historian. Larry Sawinski, the one of the original museum directors, kind of saddled me with that. Larry knew the Pacific or yes. very well, but he didn't know beans about uh, the Mediterranean War or the European War. You know, that's so he relied on me to do that. And I put on the Saturday programs. I have a committee: uh, Gene Holly, Jesse Brain, and I'm hopeful that Hal Williamson, who was the original museum. It's a lot of fun. And talking to you just here, not only here, but at other times and, and listening to you, you are quite knowledgeable on uh, European history. How, how have you become so knowledgeable? Uh, I mean, have you read a lot about it? Or oh, yeah. Has it been a big interest for you? Yeah. It's been, yeah, been an interest for, I can tell you as much about the Napoleonic Wars as I can about, uh, not quite as much about it. More than on the about the Civil War, but I, I uh, so just military history. In well, there's a magazine there. called Military History. Yeah, I've it before. Okay, yes, I, I, I really subscribed, subscribed to that since it first came out. Yeah, that's why I saved those issues someday. I've got them about so high, every one of them, I'll donate them okay. to the museum. This nice. Friday, I've got to do Joy Bishop's show, and I've got to do, we're going to have a, I'll be interviewing a Korean War uh, Middle of Honor winner, so i got to go back and I've got to read up on the Korean War. I've already pulled out a magazine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do her show uh, once or twice a month. And uh, occasionally I do a little work for, for TV. Oh, Joey, Joey English. Yeah. 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 John, thank you so much. My pleasure, I'll tell you. You, you, know, about me, man. you know more about me than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give you, give you the tape and then she can learn oh, some great. stuff about you. All right. Well, generally, I don't talk that much. <laughs> to say. Well, uh, that was great. Well, well, I, I appreciate your patience and everything. It's been a pleasure. What I'll do is, since I've got two of them, I'll put them together, and uh, then I'll, I'll give you one once, well, I, once you. I got them together and stuff like well, that. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. I've got a tape copy machine, so.